I'm recording now, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the symposium. Today's presentation is going to be an introduction to FTC Blocks Programming with Stephen Baker and Sam Good. Just a quick reminder before we get started, if you have any questions or comments throughout their presentation, uh, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring them. And please keep in mind uh, that all of your comments and questions should be important to coaches professionals. Okay, you guys can get started. Okay, then we will get started. So welcome to our session. We're gonna be talking about how to use the FTC Blocks programming tool. So I'm Stephen Baker. I'm a member of EO Robotics Team 7373 Carbon Fiber, and I'm going to be presenting with I'm Sam Haygood, and I'm also a member of 7373 Carbon Fiber. Awesome. So if we go ahead and get going, first off, a quick introduction about this, and looks like someone else just wanted to do that. Oh, awesome. So first off, we're going to say, who is this presentation for? And really, this is going to be anyone who's new to FTC or returning that hasn't programmed before and wants to get started on a team that uses blocks. It could also be for maybe a new team, a rookie team, who wants to get started programming a robot. You're not familiar with the FTC pro programming and control system, then this would be a great place to get started. Who is this not for? Returning blocks programmers, if you've already used the blocks programming tool, or if you're familiar with another programming language like Java, this is probably not the place. Um, finally, what are we going to do in this presentation? We're going to first start off by discussing the reasons for why we would use blocks, learning how to set up blocks and program with it creating two basic examples of op modes programmed for the robot, and then finally tips and tricks from our team of how we've used blocks in the past. So going on, the two of us presenting, as we said right at the beginning, so I'm gonna go ahead and let all these animations go. So we're both on Eagle Robotics Team 7373 Carbon Fiber. This is my uh, third year in FTC. This is Sam's second year in FTC. So in the 2019-20 season, Eagle Robotics was first place in Spire Award, winning Alliance Captain, and then our other team that Sam was on last year was Pemberton Division finalist, all of the Georgia State Championship. In the 2018-19 season, which I was on, one of our Eagle Robotics teams received the third place Inspire Award, first place Think Award, and we finalized as Think Award in the Houston World Championship. Between us, we've got extensive FTC control system experience, programming via Blocks, Java, Kotlin, Android Studio, and various tools familiar with the Red Robotics Control Hub and Expansion Hub, and then nine combined years between all of us in various first programs. For first, starting off, just a little bit about blocks. There's three recommended programming languages or interfaces systems for FTC, blocks, on the Java, and Android Studio. And the most basic way to put it is, as you go from left to right on the scale, your learning curve is gonna increase, your setup time is gonna increase, and your overall complexity in programming is gonna increase as well. So blocks actually would be the easiest way to get started programming in FTC. And I'm gonna make sure it looks like we have someone in Q&A. Um, okay, looks like we're good with there, so I'm gonna keep going. So what I just said, blocks being easiest to get started. So what is blocks and why should we use it? Blocks was originally added during the 2017-18 season, packaged into the FTC robot controller software. And reasons to use blocks is a very minimal learning curve. I think I said that a moment ago, very little setup you need to program because you only need a web browser and the robot controller device itself. So you can do this on any platform, Windows, Mac, Chromebook. Don't do it on your iPhone, but you could. Uh, iPad as well. Other things to be aware of in order to make code changes that will populate on the robot, you're gonna need to be connected directly to the robot controller. This could be a downside for some teams. And then it's harder to share your code across multiple platforms than it would be using something like Java. Going on, first we're going to talk about our control hardware and then control software. And by the way, I'm talking a lot right now. I'm going to pivot it to Sam after we go over some of this stuff. So as far as the control software and the devices, there's two devices we need to know about. The first one is going to be the robot controller. This year, that's either going to be an Android phone or a Red Robotics Control Hub. This is the device that stores and processes your team's robot code. Basically, all the code you write using the Blocks programming tools to make your robot do something. It's either the Control Hub or Android phone, as I mentioned earlier. And the robot controller only receives instructions from the driver station as far as what it needs to be doing at a certain time. 
driver station phone is a separate device connected to up to two game pads and this is connected directly to the robot controller over a wi-fi connection and this tells the robot controller not only gamepad inputs but it's also going to start and stop the program for you quick drink of water there um, also you have the rev robotics control hub and expansion hub you may be familiar with these but the expansion hub is a device you're going to connect to your robot controller and this is going to allow you to connect to various robot hardware, including motors, sensors, um, <clears throat> servos, as well as other devices. Your robot code, as I said, is going to run on the Android-based robot controller, the Android phone, and the control hub. Your options being Android phone or control hub connected to one or two expansion hubs, depending upon the device you're using. The control hub is almost like this expansion hub device plus an Android phone, which is really cool to have. The question is, okay, you got an Android phone, how do I get the software I need on there to write my Blocks programming? And that's what we're gonna talk about right now on this installing the control software slide. Oops, or we're not, because I'm gonna advance the slide by accident. There we go. So what you're gonna wanna do, this is the easiest way, actually I think only a couple days ago it was released, this is the Rev Hardware Client. You can download this from revrobotics.com slash software. And this is going to let you update firmware across your control hub and expansion hub, as well as installing the robot controller and driver station applications needed to run the blocks interface and run your code in general during the first tech challenge match. As far as setting up the robot controller, there's a few steps you need to do to make it connect to the driver station over Wi-Fi. We're gonna talk about this really quickly, but I want you to know that there are various resources that you can go back to to look at this. And you could always screenshot and take notes during this. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly as we do want to get to talking about blocks. So first off, setting up the robot controller device. If you're using an Android phone and not the control hub, then you're going to go through a series of these steps. And the exact steps are going to differ based on your phone model and operating system. Right now, these images are showing version 7. We're going to look at version 8 in a moment. The first thing you're going to do is open settings by selecting it from your apps list. Like Wi-Fi, have three vertical dots at the top right. This is going to show more options. And step four, you're going to select Advanced, have Wi-Fi Direct. Have three vertical dots at the top. It's going to show a few more options. And one of those options being, if it'll let me advance my slide, configure device. Once you click this, and I'm going to enable my laser pointer, actually. You should see a tiny red dot, and I'm moving through the slides. You're going to change the device name to match a specific naming convention that's required by FIRST. And this is going to be your team member, followed by a hyphen, followed by a group letter, and I'll explain what this means in a moment, and then followed by the device type. Your robot controller, this is going to be RC. So this group letter is only important. You can actually omit it if you don't have this particular scenario. But if your team has multiple robot controller and driver station combinations, you're going to want to add this group letter of an A, B, or C to indicate which set of robot controller driver station phones this is. Once you do that, you can also do what's shown down here, optionally set the Wi-Fi direct timeout to never disconnect. And it's going to be similar steps on version 8. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, opening settings, network and internet, Wi-Fi, so just slightly different interface, Wi-Fi preferences, Wi-Fi direct, tapping through dots once again at the top to reveal, configure device, and then changing this device name, match the naming convention required by first, which I talked about a moment ago. So us, for example, for our first robot controller driver station set, this robot controller would be 7373ARC. Now, if you're using a control hub, overall setting up the control hub is a lot easier. I'm extremely excited to use the control hub this season. Seems like it's very beneficial. But you're going to connect your control hub to power. And then instead of doing anything on the control hub, obviously it does not have a screen, so that presents a problem. You're going to connect your computer to the Wi-Fi network broadcasted by the control hub. Nothing you need to do to set the control hub up with this. It's just going to come with that. So you're going to go in your computer's Wi-Fi settings. You're going to have a default network name that's either FIRST or FTC. Make sure to change this, open a web browser, and navigate to this IP address. Once again, you can come back to the resources. I'm not going to read this out. You're going to advance fairly quickly. And then for setting up the robot controller, if you're using control hub once again, manage at the top. And then you're going to change this control hub name to match the naming convention shown above. To go on setting up and connecting the driver station, you're going to repeat the exact same process with the robot controller phone, except at the end of the phone name, you're going to put DS instead of RC. 
set the Wi-Fi, go to Wi-Fi direct settings, configure, and then set your device name, except DS at the end. Next thing we need to do is connect our driver station to the robot controller. To do that, open the FTC driver station, tap the three dots at the top right, and there's a button for settings. Once you're in there, you're going to see a variety of options. One of these is going to be your pairing method. You're going to select the pairing method option, and then there's two method options. One is going to be Wi-Fi Direct, and the other is going to be Control Hub. And you're going to use the one corresponding to your type of robot controller as shown on this table. Going on from there, you're going to go one step back, and instead of clicking pairing method, you're going to click pair with robot controller right here, and select the robot controller phone that matches. So remember, these steps are going to happen on your driver station, and you're pairing the driver station with the robot controller. And once again, if you're on Control Hub, the process is fairly easier. All you're going to do is connect to the Control Hub's Wi-Fi network in the driver station phone settings, and you're done. They talk. Um, one other thing you might need to do, which is why we've included it, is configuring the addresses for the expansion hub. And I'm not going to talk about this specifically, just because we're focused more on the Blocks programming tool than we are the Rev hardware directly. But do know that this might be a step you need to do, and you can find online resources to do this. Finally, we're going to look at setting up a robot hardware configuration. And this step right now is very key. So you've got to tell the Blocks programming tool what devices you have connected to your robot in order for you to be able to program those devices. So we're going to look at a quick example of that going on now. So what we're doing is opening the FTC driver station app. It's like, OK, this is going a bit fast. We're going to slow it down a little bit. So I click the three dots at the top right. You'll notice settings, configure robot. So we're going to keep going. Once I get there, I'm going to hit the new button. You'll see the control hub appears. I'm going to hit scan once again, though. And that might happen in a moment. There we go. If you scan, that's OK. I'm going to click on Control Hub Portal, where you can see the Control Hub, and then I also have an Expansion Hub connected to it. I clicked on my Expansion Hub in this case, and then in a moment, I'm going to click on Motors, but these are all the different devices I can add. So once I do that, I select the device type. In this case, it's a Go Build a 5202 series motor on my drive train. I have four motors in total, and each of them, so this one's the back right motor. You'll notice I'm specifically doing this where all words are a single word combined, but each letter of subsequent words, or the first letter of that word is uppercase, something called camel case. It just makes it a bit easier, and especially if you transfer to Java later on, you will be a bit used to that naming convention already. So I'm going to keep going on. You can change the names of other devices, such as the IMU, an inertial measurement device that does angle measurement, among some other things. It's built into the expansion hub. So just you should be familiar with this overall process right now. So now configuring a servo, for instance. And we're going to go on from there a bit more. You can save the configuration name. I'm going to call it something like Ultimate Goal Push Plot 2020 and hit OK. And all you need to do now is scroll down and activate that new configuration. And with that, we are ready to look at programming in blocks. So let's advance the slide real quick. One more. And I'm going to pass it over to Sam. Yes. Um, so um, next slide, please. So before you can actually use the box programming, you have to connect to your computer to the robot controller's Wi-Fi. And the way you do that is you go to the driver station options menu and go to the about option. And then look under about robot controller network connection. And under that, we'll have the IP address, the name, and the password. And if you, uh, if, when you connect, it prompts you for security pin, select password and put the password in instead. And then go into your web browser and put in the IP address, which is directly below that password. Another way you can access this information is on the driver controller phone, click those three dots and go to program and manage, and you'll find the same info. So this is the interface you'll see when you are in the block coding. So we'll start at the top. So at the very top, 
there's the save op mode, export to Java, download op mode, download image of blocks. And those do what they sound like they do. Uh, directly below that is how you select whether it's a teleop code or an autonomous code. And then next to that is setting it in a group. And if two codes have the same group name, they will be next to each other when you're selecting code to run in the um, driver control station. So in the on the left side of the screen, there is where all the blocks that you'll use are. And then in the center area is the uh, where you'll actually assemble the blocks into code. And then on the far right is the Java code behind it. You don't need to look at this, uh, but if you want to get an idea for how it translates into Java, you can use that. So uh, going back to those tabs, uh, there are several tabs. The first one of such is the logic tab. This has stuff like if statements and and statements. And where you would use these is, let's say you want something to happen if you're pushing down a specific button, like the X button. Or for the and statement, if you're pushing the stick forwards, and a button is pushed. There are also OR and NOT, and uh, the OR key, the, the OR one acts like a, uh, essentially either if one of the two conditions are met. And the NOT one uh, is if the condition is not met. So the next tab is loops, and this contains loops like repeat a certain amount of times. It also has repeat until, which will repeat until a certain condition or conditions are met. There's also, uh, yeah, that's it, that you'll really be using. So after that, there's the math tab. This contains basic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Where you use that is, let's say you want to have a code that will slow down the robot once it starts, um, you know, moving. So let's say you want to have it slow down. You may multiply the power of the motor by, let's say, 0.5 to half the speed. Um, the next tab, under the next tab, has text and manipulation of text. Uh, you probably will end up not using this overall, so I'll just move on. Uh, under the lists is, uh, it's a way of storing multiple values in a, well, a list, so you don't have to individually store them. Um, after that is the variables tab, which uh, allows you to store individual values. And uh, this is useful because, well, for instance, last year, my team used uh, the variables to position a robot component relative to another component. So we used the position of one of them and set that to a variable and then perform math on it to get the other position. After that is the functions. So this is essentially if you have like a long section of code, let's say 10 blocks or something, and it repeats a lot, you can shorten it down to a single uh, block that you can use repeatedly. And that helps compact your code and make it easier. Then there's miscellaneous. Uh, the thing you will use the most out of these is the comments. Uh, comments are useful because if you uh, leave your code and come back to it a couple of days later, you might not know what anything does anymore. Or if someone else is working on the code, 
and you need to look at it, it helps uh, figure out what the code actually does. So comments are very useful. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pass it back over to Steven. Okay, so Sam just told you a bit about some of the blocks that come with Google Blockly, no matter what really context you're using them in, either first tech challenge or whatever else you could use Blockly for. So we're now going to talk a bit more about the blocks that are specific to FTC. I'm going to start off and then hand it back over to Sam in a moment. One of these really important sections is going to be a linear op mode. What this does, as the slide says here perfectly, is hold functions and variables that are necessary for the flow of your program. Now, before we look at the specific blocks that are included in linear op mode, it's good to understand the process of running a program if you're unfamiliar with First Tech Challenge. So let's go on from here. Three main phases, the first one being stop. So once you select your program, the program is not running. So the robot is stopped. Before you actually run the program, before the robot moves across the field, it's in a phase called initialization. And during this phase, you're just going to want to set servos to a correct position. Java programmers have to deal with this a bit more because they have to manually get variables for every single piece of hardware. You don't have to do that, which is nice. But you are going to maybe position your servos, activate a motor if you need to. Maybe if you need to hold a motor in place, to keep your robot inside of the 18 by 18 by 18 sizing cube. And then once your team hits the play button on their driver station, it's going to make the program active, meaning it's running. Your robot can actually be moving during this. That's OK. And then it'll eventually transition back to stop when you need it to. And then also the two main phases of the match, this doesn't matter too much, but I know Sam mentioned the drop down earlier of choosing between autonomous and teleop. So autonomous being the 30 second period at the beginning and the teleop being the two minute period at the end of the match. So you would select the op modes if needed from each of these drop downs, autonomous from this left drop down on the driver station app, and teleop from the right drop down over here. So let's go on from there. It's the linear op mode. The first one is wait for start. And what this is going to do, we said the initialization phase is before the op mode is active, before the robot can actually run. So we're going to call wait for start after we're done with all of our initialization actions and tell the robot to not do anything, don't run anything until our op mode is started and we're ready to run the robot. Our next one is sleep. And this is a pretty important one to know because it just pauses your program from running. One example I can think of that you might want to do this in is if you're doing a very basic autonomous, you could tell your robot to move forward for two seconds, for instance. And to do that, you would set your motor powers, you would sleep for a specified amount of time, and then stop the robot. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Finally, the op mode is active method, and this is going to return a true or false for you, indicating whether that op mode is running or not. So when that op mode is in that active phase, it returns true. When it's in in it or stopped, it's going to return false. And then I'm going to switch back over to Sam to talk about the gamepad and a couple other sections. Okay, so the gamepad is we're going to get the inputs from your controller. Um, this has stuff like the left and right sticks, which are values from which output values from negative one to one. Uh, then there's going up, there's the D-pad and the buttons. Both of those output a true or false value, depending on whether they're put pressed or not. Above that is the bumpers, which are also true or false. And then the triggers, which are on a scale from 0 to 1. So uh, then under the DC motor dual category, you'll find motors. Now, you have to have these motors in your hardware configuration for it to show up. So you need those to actually use these. Uh, so that's important. So once you do have that, uh, you'll have, well, first, here's a power, the method using power where you set a specific power and then it moves and then until you tell it to stop, which you have to do in order for it to stop, you set it back to zero. And then there's the other method, which uses encoders, where it allows it to go to a specific position 
detected by the encoder, and then it'll stop. So there are also servo um, functions. Uh, there are two types. There are continuous rotation and regular. The continuous rotation servos are, uh, they work similarly to motors, how they're powered, where they're on a scale from negative one being going one direction, zero, not being not moving at all and one being uh and one being the other direction and then and then the regular servos are a predefined position on a range of zero being all the way in one position and one being all the way in another position so also sensors which allow you to get inputs from the field to detect uh, stuff like the distance sensor you could look at the distance from a wall or two to determine the position of the robot on the field uh, you could also use the color sensors to detect a specific color on the ground so for instance in this game the you could detect the white stripe on the ground that shows the border of the uh, launch zone. And you could also use it to detect if there are rings for the autonomous. And then the final section is telemetry. And that's very important if you're doing any debugging. So it's useful when you're coding it. So essentially, it displays variables and such to the screen of the driver control station. So it lets you see the output of a sensor if you need to know uh, what you need to have that set to. So it helps with that. And I'll hand it back over to Stephen. OK, thanks, Sam. So we have two brief examples we're going to do just to show the idea of creating a program with Linux. The very first one we're going to do is a teleop program. By that, I mean driver control. And we're driving two motors from the gamepad. So we're going to look at that right now. If I can grab my mouse pointer. Um, no, I actually need to start this video. Okay, there we go. So we're in the list of locks programs. I'm going to say create new op mode. And this moves fairly quickly, which is probably a good thing because probably don't want this presentation to take too long, but once we create the op mode with a name, we're inside the blocks interface. You can see some of the initial code that it's created automatically, the run op mode, the wait for start call that we talked about a moment ago, the if op mode is active, a repeat while op mode is active, which we are going to need to tell you. So we're going to start off immediately by creating variables, and we're going to create one variable for each motor power. So the first one is called left motor power. You'll notice by the name of the variable, we've done it in camel case. That means each word, they're all matched together, but the first letter of each subsequent word is capitalized. So I'm gonna let this video run a bit more. So we have left motor power and the right motor power. At the beginning of our teleop loop, we're gonna set the left motor power to a value. And where do we get our input for the power? We get it from the game path. So we're gonna get that left stick Y, from the gamepad. And we're going to do the similar thing for our right motor. And we also dragged in a negative symbol here. And what that's going to do is just invert the power given from the gamepad. You might need to do that. You might not need to, just based on how your motors are oriented in comparison to the gamepad. So once we've done that, set a right motor power as well, you'll notice the comment that we added here. And having comments throughout your program is amazing. It not only helps you remember what you did in your program, it helps your team members know what you did in your, in your program, and it helps judges know what your team did in your team's program, which is crucial for judging, being able to explain which, what your code does to judges, especially for words like the control word. And then I'm adding an extra comment up here. And honestly, not sure how big this window is showing right now. 
in this, but hopefully you're able to see it clearly enough or get an idea of what's going on, of course, with the narration that's also happening. And our video paused itself. So we added comment right here. And then now all we're going to do, so we set our variables to the inputs from the gamepad. We set the power of the motors to those variables. The final thing we're going to do is print both of those motor powers to telemetry. And this has no effect on the robot's movement. This is purely just for us, so we know what we were sending to the motors at any given time. So this is going to be under utilities, as you see me scrolling to now, telemetry. And we're going to drag an add data call out here. And you'll notice originally a mistake is made. You'll see this in a moment. But you're going to want to set this key to something that you can recognize. In this case, we said left motor because it is the power for the left motor. And do another block. This one we're going to say right motor. And I'm going to skip briefly ahead because there is a slight error in the video. There we go. So now we're going to set the left motor power to be this number associated with the key and the same for the right motor power. And at this point, we have our teleop program. We can run this on a robot that has two motors. Now, one thing you do need to be aware of is this telemetry.update call. And this has to be called after your add data statements to send all the data you've added to the driver station so you can see it. And with that, we have our teleop program. So I'm going to go a bit ahead to, oh, no, not that. And we're going to start an autonomous program. All this is going to do is move the robot forward for a specified time period. And remember, if this video seems quick, you can always go back via YouTube. If you're watching this through YouTube, you can slow down the video, pause, go back as necessary. So we deleted the while op mode is active call. And one thing you might notice when you're watching the video is that the second op mode is active call is redundant. And if you notice that, you are correct. There was no need to add that. So do be aware of stuff like that. You want to avoid adding extra if statements that are, are, are just not necessary for your program. So if we keep going, we set the power of the left motor to be 0.5. And we did a sleep call for two seconds, or 2,000 milliseconds. And what this is going to do is just going to set the motors to run. And after two seconds, we're going to set the power of the motors back to zero. Of course, this would be a highly simple autonomous. I don't know what team would do this. I mean, you might be able to place the wobble goal within a two-second period into one of the zones. So this could be an applicable autonomous program to start out maybe in a first league meet season. But now one thing you might notice is maybe you're like the milliseconds, this doesn't look nice. 2,000 milliseconds. Why can't I say two seconds, for instance? And there is, in fact, a way we can do this. We're going to look at that real quick. So also showing here how you can set the power to anything you want. It could be at like a negative 0 0.5 with the other being 0. But we're going to create a function for sleeping instead. So we're going to drag this block out here. We're going to click the settings cog and set our input. So I'm going to create one input called seconds and drag this into our function. So remember, I believe Sam was the one who said that functions are ways to repeat pieces of code where you can call it multiple times without duplicating it, especially if you have math expressions that you only want to run once or only want to write once and run multiple times. Functions are great examples for this. So in this case, we took a function, we put a parameter on it called seconds, and then we're multiplying the seconds parameter by 1,000 and sending that to the sleep method. So this is doing the same exact thing as that main sleep method with milliseconds, except we're just making it a bit nicer for ourselves with an included math expression. So you see we drag out the function call. And then we go to the math tab. Choose a number of seconds. In this case, you would only need to choose two. You're going to save the op mode up here. Remember that you have to save the op mode in order for it to update on a robot controller phone. Otherwise, if you keep changing blocks and try and run that, you're not going to see any change. Your robot. Final thing to know is now you'll see my three op modes. And then you can see which ones are enabled or disabled. So what enabling an op mode does is shows it in your driver station app. If you remember, I talked about the dropdown earlier for autonomous and teleop. And that's what this is going to be for. If you disable an op mode, you're not going to see it in your list. So maybe you have an old op mode you used at League Meet 1, and you kept that on your robot controller phone, but you don't need it for League Meet 2. Just disable it so it doesn't appear in your list. You can see I'm checking and unchecking. 
So with that, we are done with this video. Now, two extra features to know with blocks that we think are pretty cool. First one's going to be blocks and Java working together. So maybe you've got one team member that's familiar with Java, and the rest of the team doesn't know Java. So your team needs to use blocks. You can still get the advantages of having a Java programmer by them writing in Java. Another great example of why you want to do this is maybe your team is only familiar with blocks, but you want to use Java next season. You can gradually move your team into using Java away from blocks in this strategy. So totally fine if you don't understand what this code means. Of course, this is not a session on how to use Java, but it would appear as standard blocks when a Java programmer wrote this. So I think it's a really cool feature that teams should know about if they're in one of these scenarios where it would be useful to them. Another thing you definitely should know about is the downloadable blocks editor. And what this is going to allow you to do is, I said at the beginning that you can only edit your blocks code when you're connected to the robot controller. And that is true, but only partially. Fortunately, you can download a blocks editor offline onto your computer, so you can edit wherever you are. The only catch is whatever files you have on your offline editor have to be re-uploaded onto your robot controller phone. So this here shows the steps. You download the blocks editor. It's going to download a zip file. And it's going to be specifically within your configuration. So if you need a different blocks editor for a different configuration, you need to switch that configuration and then re-extract, re-download, extract, and open this index.html. From there, you can edit your blocks programs just like usual, but make sure you re-upload these files to your actual robot controller when you're done, since you would be on that offline editor. And then we're going to conclude out from here. So a few recommendations our team has from times in the past that your robotics has used blocks. Um, first one is you can have two programmers. Um, this is especially important maybe if you do have those multiple team members who are able to use blocks, so you can segment out your code. One team member does not have the full responsibility to get everything done. It's more diversified. So you could maybe have two programmers, one for autonomous and one for teleop. Second thing, back up your programs frequently, especially during competition. If your robot controller dies, your control hub messes up and you have to reset it, you want to make sure you still have all of your code. So you can download the opmap file as shown in the blocks editor. And save it to a folder that's shared within your team, maybe a Google Drive or SharePoint. And then mark that file name with a version number, either 1.0 for major changes, 0.1 for minor changes. So maybe a major change would be between League Meet 1 and League Meet 2. A minor change might be something small, like changing a motor power, changing a math equation in it. Very important at defining and using not only variables, but also actually functions throughout your code. And this is going to make the program easier for judges to understand and your team as well, because you've got it more segmented out. If you don't have variables, it's going to be hard to know how stuff is being transferred to other parts of your code. And then finally, comment every section of code or functions. And this is also the same thing, making it easier for judges to understand and other team members. And with that, we are concluding the slides of this presentation. You can contact us at team7373robotics at gmail.com. You can email our coach at vsmith at mtparentschool.com. Or you can go to our team website, which has a whole bunch of resources. This is eorobotics.net. And then finally, you can scan this QR code shown here, or go to eorobotics.net slash blocks programming to see additional resources. And with that, we are going to open it up to Q&A. It looks like we do not have any Q&A right now, but if anyone does, go ahead and submit a question. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. We're gonna go maybe 30 seconds. If I don't see anyone that looks like working on a question, then we'll go ahead and conclude this. Sam, anything else you think we need to add? I can't think of anything else that we need to mention off the top of my head. Okay, awesome. So we still don't have any questions coming, so I think we'll go ahead and call it quits for this. So thank you to everyone who came. We both hope this was helpful for you. And then feel free to reach back out to our team or go to the link with resources to get some additional 
any information about how you can get started. All right, good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you.